I won't mind that either. Live from San Francisco, it's The Cube. Covering Red Hat Summit 2018. Brought to you by Red Hat. And welcome back to theCUBE. We're here live in San Francisco on day two of our coverage of Red Hat Summit 2018. I'm John Troyer. I'm here with Larry Socker. Larry is the, hi Larry. We are Larry, you are the global lead for infrastructure growth and strategy at Accenture. That's correct. So, and welcome as a first timer to theCUBE. You're now a member yeah, of theCUBE alums. I'm now a member of theCUBE alums. Uh, Good awesome, to be here. Awesome. So, one of the themes here that we've noticed here on, on day two of the conference is the reality of of hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, the demos up on stage have been real production workloads from real companies at a global scale. Yeah. Uh, and the, the theme, uh, it's been a lot about OpenShift open, and, and OpenShift and that as a bridge uh, for the, with the rest of Red Hat's uh, stack. So, Accenture, yeah. Global SI, you know, work with very big companies, very complicated uh, problems and enabling them. Hybrid cloud, is that important for you and your uh, customers? A absolutely. Um, Accenture actually got out very aggressively about four or five years ago with our cloud first strategy. And, um, and it was very public centric. You know, how, do we, you know, how do you start to take advantage of the innovation of the hyperscalers, the AWS's, the Azure's, to really start to innovate, drive, drive agile application development and get out there very quickly. However, if you take a look at our clients, you know, they're typically large, complex, global 2000 companies, and for a variety of reasons, whether it's uh, regulatory reasons, so GXP compliance, if you go to the pharmaceutical industry, HIPAA for healthcare, you know, PCI, um, they, 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 they've really, you know, they continue to invest in their data centers. I mean, other reasons, uh, Telco Cloud's an interesting one, it's a proximity thing, it's the, the thing that actually connects the, oh, uh, the, the public providers and NFEs getting built on that. Um, performance, you know, if you start to look with SAP driving an eight terabyte HANA, um, you know, where do you start to deploy that? So, um, you know, and then even investments. A lot of our clients have, have significant investments in their data centers and infrastructure. So what we've been doing over the last uh, probably six to eight months is really taking a look at a lot of the innovation that we saw from those hyperscalers and bringing it to the, to the data center and, and really trying to create industrialized private clouds with the, the same kind of standardization uh, that, that you have in, you know, in, in the world of Amazon and Azure. And, and you know, same automation, the cloud operating model, and really start to do that, not, not just in the data center with private cloud, but also the rest of infrastructure. Uh, and, and ultimately our clients are going to end up with, with hybrid environments. So we're, you know, we've been using our, our Accenture cloud platform to, to integrate you know, the public providers, now in the, in the private side you know, with, with OpenShifts, the, you know, the VMwares of the world, and even back into the legacy infrastructure. Well, that's, that's fascinating. And also I think really grounded in reality. Yep. I mean, the, the tech industry, there's, a, you know, we all, there's all these pendulums and hype cycles. And a few years ago, it's right, right? We were, we were talking a lot about public, there was a lot of innovation, and, it, and maybe it's taken a few years for the private stack and the hybrid stack to catch up to give you that uh, advantage in terms of agility and in terms of speed to market, speed to production. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, maybe what that relationship uh, with, uh, with OpenShift, you say you, you're seeing, we saw, we, like I said, we've seen a lot of OpenShift in production. Yeah. Are you seeing that as well? Yeah, yeah, we, de we definitely are. I mean, we, you know, we have a lot of our clients who are looking, okay, hey, I, this look, I, I want to start getting to more serverless architectures. I want to start adopting the new technologies, agile development, um, you know, start to really embrace DevOps. At the same time, um, it's you know, for either for data gravity or for compliance reasons, there's certain applications that just can't move into the public environment. So SAP you know, has been challenging to, to do, particularly as we start to get HANA. Um, so, you know, they've been starting to look and say, okay, well, OpenShift becomes a very attractive alternative to start developing applications that I can then, uh, you know, run in a private environment as well as bring up into Amazon and Azure, so. So, a few years ago, for better or worse, one of the terms people were using was lift and shift. Yeah. Right? And uh, people were taking their, you know, or legacy that this, a lot of years of, of battle-tested infrastructure, yeah. and do you just hoist it into the cloud? Do I have to rewrite it? Can I containerize it? I mean, what are people doing, and how are you, how are you helping them question. prepare? You know, going back to the scale of our clients, you know, a lot, our clients will have anywhere from 2,000 to over 20,000 workloads and applications. So the, the notion of lift and shift or, or modernization, it, it's not a binary problem. So what we actually did was we took our, our app monitor modernization practice, which is part of our technology business. Uh, we coupled it with our infrastructure migration team, so, so I'm a part of our Accenture operations group, and we created an integrated cloud factory. 
Uh, and then we actually took, we had two different sets of tools, we combined them into one Accelerate toolkit, and, and what that does is it allows us to do the upfront application portfolio assessment, we figure out the dispositions of the applications, you know, what, 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 what needs to stay together, you know. Um, we determine which ones need to be refactored or remediated or modernized, um, and that's our, our, our technology organization. And, and then for those that we need to just migrate or you know, a few minor changes, we then have, you know, do all the planning, the migrations of that. And we're able to do this at, you know, at scale with the factory, leveraging a combination of onshore and offshore and these tools to do all the automation and do the, you know, the wave planning, keeping dependencies and, and moving data around. And, and we're able to do you know, anywhere, at one client we're doing over 1,200 workloads a month. That's amazing. I mean, the, 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 the scale and the speed and time to market, even right. in the demos here on stage, has, has yeah. been actually pretty, pretty surprising to me because it, it, it means that it's real. As our people shift, as people are shifting their portfolios uh, into a hybrid stance, some workloads here, some workloads in a multi-cloud. Can you talk a little bit about how you're approaching multi-cloud and how you're approaching maybe multi-cloud over time? Well, you know. The, I mean, we made a big bet on our Accenture cloud platform, so which, which is really a, a CMP. Started very public focused. You know, how do I provision and manage and optimize my workloads across the public providers? We've now started to integrate into the private side much more aggressively. We were always doing it at our clients, but it was a very custom one-off. As we start to industrialize and standardize on the private side, it now gives us seamless hybrid cloud management. We're actually extending that to go to legacy. We've still got a number of clients, like insurance companies, where they've got significant business logic trapped in their mainframes. And our app modernization guys are starting to wrap those with microservices, starting to do front end development in OpenShift, as an example, um, and, and get closer to the users for, you know, for better customer experience, much more agile delivery, while still maintaining that frame. And, and what we find is as you've got these distributed applications based on microservices, you now need to manage across that hybrid environment. And it's, it's public, it's private, but it's also legacy infrastructure. Mm. Yeah, and that's got to be complicated. One of the other themes of this show, it prob probably coming out of Red Hat's own culture of openness and of, uh, uh, we had a great, uh, I love the, the keynote this morning talking about, well, you know, planning is great, but you know, the, eventually the plan is going to hit the battlefield and you've got to be adaptive and you've got to be uh, agile. So uh, when you are talking with a CIO and when you're talking with these leads of business and their IT leads, yeah. uh, you know, what are some of the things that you're preparing them with and, and what are maybe some of the signals that uh, they're, uh, they're ready to do this versus maybe not ready to do this? Yeah, yeah. you know, that's a very good question. Um, what, what's interesting is, when I talk to most of our the CIOs, I think they've got a pretty good handle on the technologies. I mean, it, it's, and, and not to trivialize, it's not simple technology, but I think most have focused a lot of their energy on that. I think their biggest challenges are the culture and, and the operating model. So, you know, if you look, think of how the hyperscalers do it, I mean, first they standardize, which I think that's, you know, these CIOs are typically do, you know, they, they're not driving standard t-shirt sizes. They don't have that discipline to have a standardized service catalog, which you need to well, automate. Traditionally in the enterprise, everything yeah. was custom, everything was bespoke. Exactly, so, so it's not in their DNA to go to that gross you know, standardization. And I mean, think about the hyperscalers. I mean, while Amazon innovates at an incredible pace, they still have a discrete set of services. And if you can automate and do real cloud operating model, you really need to have that level of standardization. Uh, the, the, the whole operating, the business and operational transformation is very difficult. You know, it's interesting, now the apps guys have typically done a reasonably good job, I mean, getting out there and, and using agile development, you know, they're, they're embedded in the BUs, doing their sprints, et cetera. It's still some work to be done for the infrastructure guys. You know, if you, if you start to take a look at it, um, you, you could have an app team doing you know, two week sprints, they're ready to drop code, all of a sudden they have to wait 12 weeks for the infrastructure to catch up. So we've been spending a lot of time looking at how do we enable software to find infrastructure, how do we start to even do inf you know, infrastructure as code with similar sprints and embed into the uh, BU scrums, et cetera. Talent's a huge issue. I mean, they're all struggling. It's very hard to get people with native cloud skills, it, you know, it source them in the market. So my, most of our clients are really struggling. I mean, it's good for us as an integrator and being able to bring those skills, but, but they too need to develop those skills. Well, and that all, in some ways solves itself over time as standardization happens, right? Yep. As Kubernetes becomes uh, more ubiquitous, you will have more people trained up in Kubernetes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, same thing with uh, some of the infrastructure layer. Maybe can you drill down maybe a little bit more into the infrastructure and, and and how, how are you helping, so they say the infrastructure folks become more agile, uh, you, you know, at some point you, you've got mainframes, they're not moving, so you kind of yeah. have to wall them off 
with some agile uh, layers yeah, in the we've, middle. We've been big proponents of software-defined infrastructure. I think VMware's actually done a pretty good job getting the market up to speed on software-defined data centers. So how do you how do you first use virtualization techniques like you know if you think about VMware's NSX or Cisco's ACI? How do, how do you deploy those um, to, to to provide the a vehicle to do the automation and then you know severe you know just very intense automation. Now, if I have to standardize first, but then I start to automate. So whether it's V, you know, VMware with vRealize, it's uh, you know Ansible. So I mean, we've seen uh, Red Hat do some great work around Ansible and doing that automation. Uh, we use Chef in our in our Accenture Cloud platform, but um, but but really starting to drive that similar type standardization and automation. Um, but but you have to change how you operate to do that, and I think that's where a lot of people struggle. So they, you know, they may have automation projects, etc., but they they haven't really fundamentally shifted how they do it. So at one of our clients, a lot Sciences client, uh, we actually were doing, a, we were implementing a software defined data center. Uh, we had ServiceNow as, uh, as, as the, uh, the front end portal, you know, vRealize automation, integrated with a GXP compliance system, and we just kept iterating through in two week sprints, we would incrementally deliver, you know, first minimal viable product to compute and storage, then up the t-shirts, we got into, you know, more database as a service, eventually even S being able to spin up SAP basis instances. And we, we were able to leverage a lot of the automation, including the network, which is oftentimes a long pole, in order to accomplish that. Right, right. So starting with bite-sized pieces, incremental, exactly. incremental improvements. And, and that's the great thing about Agile, right? I mean, and, and the, but the problem is that the apps guys have known it for a while. As infrastructure guys, we're a little new. So we've, we've actually taken our Accenture DevOps platform and we've created an infrastructure's code plugin you know, that uses GitHub and Jira to now deliver drop releases of infrastructure's code. Well, that's great. I mean, you mentioned a lot of different tools and platforms here. A lot of them open source, right? We're here yes. at Red Hat Summit. Uh, I think one of the again one of the signals of this week uh, there were you know announcements with Microsoft announcements with IBM you know very serious uh, and you all have been working with them very serious enterprise ready uh, uh, ecosystem here. Do you get any pushback about the open source nature of some of these things? You know, less and less. And a number of years ago, there was clearly, uh, you know, because of particularly licensing enterprise grade applications, I think that, you know, I think people have become much more comfortable with open source. I mean, one, one, one thing I often look at is Kafka. I mean, you look at, I mean, I, I, I see so much Kafka getting deployed right now. It's, you know, open source model. It's, um, you know, I'm seeing it used in so many different uh, uses, you know, use cases and, and, and development. And so I think, I think a lot of, and thanks to Red Hat, you know, give them credit for bringing open source to mainstream and to the enterprise market, um, putting, you know, licensing around it. So I, th I think, uh, no, I don't see the same kind of pushback anymore, and I think the world's changed. Uh, it's kind of the new the normal, better. right? It's yeah. the, uh, either both at the cloud layer and then at the infrastructure layer and the exactly. automation, everything like that. You know, um, maybe talk a little bit more about some of uh, Accenture, what I've, what, I've, what I've been gathering here, right? There's a bunch of open source tools you're using, but you have your own tool sets too, right? And, yeah. then, and, and the Accenture Cloud. Can you talk a little yeah, bit about? So, so the Accenture Cloud platform, I mean, we do use a lot of third party technologies. We're not going to go reinvent the wheel. We're going to pull in the best of products that we can. I mean, and it does, and we started off, I mean, it's been out there for about five years, you know, it's be, you know, we, we have an orchestration platform that's built into it. Um, we do use a lot of Chef to do um, you know, the provisioning of, of the environments. We have a, you know, and we keep evolving it. We, we've, we've changed out billing optimization engines um, and now are very focused on how do we push it into the private world. So that brings in new tools and capabilities to do that automation. So, so, so we continue to push that. The, the, the next big step that we're focused on is the application and infrastructure management. So one of the emerging problems is we start to see microservices get a adopted and you're going to get applications that might have a front end running serverless in Amazon on you know uh, with Lambda you know distributed private cloud with a couch DB uh, you know data right. database How do you manage cache. All that, right? yeah and then a mainframe uh, reservation system so this is one of our uh, you know one of our clients has that environment how do you manage and troubleshoot across that environment. So the ability to first look at what I'll call the application or service topology, you know, up in the tools, like I just saw a Dynatech Trace presentation, AppDs of the world, but then go, you know, the east-west topology, and then mapping north-south into virtualized and physical infrastructure. And this to me is, is going to be one of our, you know, more difficult challenges because that, at the, you know, at the same time you've got that complexity, it's getting more complicated. You know, I think containers become much more dynamic, you software-defined networking, it becomes a lot harder to sectionalize and troubleshoot that. So we're starting to look at the assurance or service management side and really start to innovate you know, more there. Yeah, that's, that's amazing, and I think that's going to become more and more necessary, right? We, you know, with big companies, global, 
you know, distributed all over the world, distributed on multiple platforms with private, with private components, all these services mixed together with the service bus, you know, you know, when that blows up, it's going to blow up spectacularly. Yeah, exactly, and, and we've all been on those calls with 50 people that we can't afford to do, you know, in a, and it's every, I'm a network guy, everyone points at us, so <laughs> I, 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 I really do want the tooling and instrumentation. Um, I mean, the other big change that's, that's interesting is the operator's going to change. I mean, I think there's two major elements to that. It's obviously, you know, DevOps, you know, development and operations getting you know, much tighter together. SRE is a great example of that. And I think we, you know, if I look at DevOps right now, I feel it's still very dev-centric. I mean, we're great on CI, CD pipelines, not quite as good on the ops side. I think we got some, some room to, to, to change there. No, it, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of growth and journey, and I love that the community, like we can all learn together, and, and I think open source and, and all these pieces are a big piece of it. Yeah. But I look at it on the infrastructure side and the infrastructure operations side, one of the things we're looking at now is how do we transform uh, both our clients' operators and our own operators when we do outsourcing? So how do we take them from what was traditionally eyes on glass looking at consoles and, and now write the next uh, you know, data ingestion scripts, the, the analytic algorithms and visualizations, you know, write the next automations uh, to, to, to streamline something, and over time, tune the AI engines. As we start to adopt AI to, particularly around performance optimization, you know, how do we start to incorporate that? Absolutely, I think, yeah, we're all facing that. I mean, it sounds like uh, I'm, I really enjoyed learning about how uh, all, all, everything that Accenture is bringing to the table on this enterprise journey to the cloud. Um, Larry, thanks for joining us. Uh, Larry, uh, Larry Soccer, Global Lead for Infrastructure growth and uh, strategy at Accenture. Thanks for being on theCUBE. Thank you, enjoyed hey, it. Thanks. Uh, we are here, we're just wrapping up here. We are, we've been live here for two days at Red Hat Summit in San Francisco. We are closing up our second day. We'll be joining you in the morning tomorrow uh, as we finish off the conference. Uh, it's all, you can always count here live on theCUBE.